I would like to talk to you today a little bit about high resolution melt analysis. So let's begin by just describing what the technique is and why it's so useful. So um, the technique is, is basically um, an in-depth analysis of a typical melt curve that's produced in a qPCR reaction. So it's a post PCR melt analysis method uh, and it's used um, traditionally to determine whether or not you have um, a specific amplicon uh, in your PCR reaction. But, if you, but the curve can also be analyzed if, if under the right conditions it can, um, it can discriminate um, uh, the, the double-stranded amplicon based on sequence uh, length and GC content, which is typically what uh, what we're looking at when we do a typical null curve uh, for specificity. But you can also look at strand complementarity, and this is where we're this is where we get more into um, into um, looking at uh, single nucleotide polymorphism uh, analysis, so these kinds of things, or methylation analysis. And this is another application to uh, null curve analysis, which is the one I'm going to focus on. It's, it, it is, if done, if the experiment's done properly, it can detect down to single base differences. So, so very sensitive technique, uh, and it's, of course, rapid and inexpensive um, for uh, doing screening. So, uh, so if you're planning on screening large populations of samples where you want to determine uh, if one sample has a polymorphism or methylation or whatever versus another sample, uh, or versus samples from another population, so you're trying to discriminate between two populations or sort populations, this is a good way to go. Uh, the mutation sequence can be known or unknown, uh, and um, if, the, if the mutation is known, then it's a great way to screen that mut that, uh, between populations for that known mutation. If the sequence is is uh, unknown, if the mutation in a sequence is not known, you can at least know the mutation is there with HRM, but of course you would have to process the samples further to identify the mutation sequence. So you'd have to go and do sequence analysis uh, of those amplicons to determine specifically what that mutation is. So essentially, the way HRM works, high resolution melt, is we start off with a sample, we do the PCR, qPCR reaction, in a in a um, in an instrument that that uh, permits uh, the application of high resolution melt. So uh, all of our CFX uh, 96 and 3D4 well instruments are high resolution melt compatible, and then <coughs> you do the HRM. So and the HRM is, as I said, it's nothing more than a, than, than a regular melt curve. The reason why it's called high resolution melt is because you perform the melt uh, under um, lower temperature increments. So a typical melt curve for specificity is done in 0.5 to 1 degree increments. For HRM, you typically do it down to 0.2 degree uh, in temperature increments with a dwell time of about 10 seconds per increment to get really good, precise uh, temperature uh, increments on your melt curve. So for those of you who have never seen a melt curve before, I'll just quickly show you what it is. Uh, after real-time PCR amplification, uh, a melt curve uh, can be performed in the presence of a DNA binding uh, dye. Now, for HRM, we typically recommend a, what's called a saturating dye. Uh, because what a saturating dye does is, is, is it allows the dye molecules to completely occupy the entire um, amplicon. With cyber green, because cyber green is a known inhibitor of, of uh, TAC polymerase, you can't use enough cyber green to be able to get complete saturation of the amplicon. And I'll describe the effect of this a little bit later on in this presentation. Um, what we're looking at, essentially, is after you've done your qPCR reaction, after you've done 40 cycles or 30 cycles uh, of, of, um, of your uh, amplification, so you've amplified billions of amplicons, you, are, you start off with a lower temperature, say around 55 to 60 degrees, uh, and what you measure is um, fluorescence versus temperature. 
So at 60 degrees, all your amplicons will, will remain double-stranded. So from the 40-cycle reaction, there are billions of double-stranded amplicons that are all intercalating your dye, and the intercalated dye fluoresces very brightly. So we have a high fluorescence. We get a gradual drop-off as we increase temperature. This is only because we're ch changing the pH slightly of our, um, of our reaction mix, which causes fluorescence to drop a little bit. But really, where we start to melt is right here, where we get this significant drop-off to the baseline. And that's where we've gone from double-stranded to single-stranded. And at the inflection point, right in the middle of this, of this drop in, in, in fluorescence, it would be where your, um, your uh, melting temperature, the TM, of your amplicon of interest is. <coughs> HRN, so this is, this is what we look at when we do typical melt curve analysis. We're looking just for specificity of an amplicon. HRN focuses on both the shape of this melt curve here, plus the temperature shift between populations. So that's so, so we, we do a, a more in-depth analysis of this milk curve to determine between uh, allelic variants of our, of our um, populations. So um, if we talk about HRM versus a milk curve, HRM, as I explained to you, is an extended analysis of the milk curve. Okay? It takes it one step further. It requires additional analysis software. Um, and the software allows the normalization of the melt curves, it applies an optional temperature shift as required, and it plots the curves in a difference graph for easy visualization. So you can actually quickly pick up differences uh, in, uh, between the populations, um, between the allelic variants of your, of your, um, of your um, amplicons between the populations. And then what it does is it clusters the, the, the curves into the groups, representing the different genotypes. So if we look at this, so here is just a, a, um, a blow-up of a milk curve. So where we, where we're t looking at just this region here between these two green and, and uh, pink bars. So what the software will do is it will say, OK, let's look up here and try to set each of these red, green, and blue curves uh, to 1. So we're going to call this plateau here 1. And we're going to normalize all of these to that value 1, which, which we do here. So you can see we've normalized the melt curves up here so that the plateau is all the same for everyone. And then at the bottom of the curve, it does the same thing, sets them all to 0. So now we're going from, we're, we're going from unprocessed uh, fluorescence units to normalized units at the top and the bottom of each of these curves. And this allows us to easily see the differences between the blue, the red, and the green curves, which are, which are allelic variants in this case. Then what the software does is it subtracts, it takes one of the curves, let's say the, um, the, uh, the TT uh, variant, and it will subtract the other curves from TT at the most, um, at the largest difference between the temperatures. So you, you can see there's, there's less differences between the variants up here and less down here. And the largest difference between red, green, and blue is probably somewhere around here, maybe you know, 75.8 degrees or something like that. <coughs> so then it subtracts the curves all the way down. So, so at each temperature, it's subtracting the curves to give uh, from, from the red curve to give these difference curves. And you can see at around 75.8, you have the largest difference between each of these curves. And, and you can easily cluster them into the various variants for each population. And the software does all this for you automatically. This is the software that BioRad uh, uses. It's called Precision Melt Analysis. It's very handy because it allows you to use, uh, to, to, to run the regular qPCR reaction with, with uh, appropriate melt curve analysis settings in the protocol. And then you just import 
you now curve data into this software which comes with CFX Manager. So it's a, so it's a, it, it's a seamless integration with the software and it does all the calculations for you and allows you to look at your clustering of your different allelic variants and so on. So it's a very uh, user-friendly package. allows you to do this very, very easily. Now, getting back to the dyes, the dyes are important. So um, you really do want to make sure you're working with a saturating dye. Um, and the difference between the non-saturating and the saturating dye is that the fact that the saturating dyes are do not inhibit TAC anywhere near to the extent of non-saturating dyes. So a non-saturating dye would be like typical cyber green. Saturating dyes are dyes like evergreen. Uh, and, uh, and as I mentioned, it, the saturating dyes occupy the entire double-stranded amplicon completely, such that when you melt a region so where there's a region where you're, where you're mismatching in base pairs, that's obviously going to be the first part that will melt. You're going to lose all of the dye molecules in that region. There's no chance for a dye molecule to relocate to an unoccupied uh, region of the amplicon. Whereas with non-saturating dyes, that's exactly what can happen. So, th so th you can see here, at the same region, we have three dye molecules, two of which have relocated to <coughs> unoccupied regions of the uh, of the amplicon for fluorescence. So you get a less, you get a, a lower difference in fluorescence uh, when you when you actually melt your product versus the saturating dye. And you really want to get as high precision, as high large differences as possible uh, when you're doing HRM analysis. So what are some of the applications? I mentioned a few of them. Um, and they, they are the top ones. So, so um, mutation discovery, SNP genotyping, and methylation are by far the most uh, popular applications that are used in uh, HRM. Uh, you can also do species identification, DNA fingerprinting, screening for loss of hetero, uh, heterozygosity, and a bunch of other applications. There are uh, lots of ways you can use high resolution melt analysis. Uh, the key, of course, is always, as with any PCR-based um, experiment or qPCR-based experiment, the key is really in the design of your assay. But if you design your assay well, you will get great results with high-resolution melt. So if we talk about SNP genotyping, just one of the applications, um, we're talking about a single base substitution, um, which is prevalent in greater than or equal to 1% of the population and you can use HRM to identify the samples containing the known single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, not all SNPs are, equal, are, are equally easy, easy to differentiate, and SNPs have been classified into four different classes. From the most prevalent SNPs, these are the CT to GA allelic variants, to the least prevalent SNPs, which are the AT variants. Um, for HRM, these ones, the top three, or the top two at least, um, result in a very large temperature shift. So, so you, can, you can easily uh, delineate between CT and, and CA uh, mutations. The AT mutations uh, require a, uh, use a very, very small temperature shift. So, so, so these are more difficult, but Easily, if you design your experiment well, use the right types of amplicons uh, for, for HRM, you can easily um, uh, determine uh, and delineate the allelic variants for AT uh, SNPs as well. So HRM allows you to do all of these with good experimental design and good instrumentation, of course, good software. One of the key, key um, experimental design flaws that can happen particularly for the AT, for the class 4 SNPs, is amplicon size. Uh, it's important uh, to use, to design primers such that the amplicons containing a, a class 4 SNP are small. You want them to be well below 100 base pairs, if possible, and you can see the difference here. So if we look at the clustering of the AA, AT, and TT variants, we, we're getting 
we're getting clustering and we're getting we're seeing differences between the red, the green, and the blue, but nowhere near as nice as with a 50 base pair amphicon, where we see very clearly uh, the differences in the clustering between those mutants. And this is a key, key design aspect that people often overlook when they, uh, when they design their experiments for high resolution melt. Now, um, I'm not going to go into the design of experiments in detail. I'll get to that in the next slide. But I did want to just, um, just open uh, the door to other types of applications as well and just sort of show you where high resolution melt fits in the spectrum of applications that are available, particularly for genotyping. So um, if basically what I've done here is I've classified projects by size. So if we look at uh, lower throughput projects where, we're, where we've determined or we want to determine between populations a particular SNP or confirm that a SNP is there, HRM is definitely uh, a good way to go. Um, if you want high flexibility to do multiple SNPs, uh, and of course if you know the targets, uh, and you're looking at reasonable amounts of samples and lower amounts of SNPs, this is where high resolution melt really plays well for a project. If we start to get into higher amounts of SNPs per sample, so let's say we, we want to span all of the SNPs all the known SNPs in a particular gene or a particular set of genes where we're going well above, let's say, 10 to 15 SNPs, which is where HRM is really great, then you'd want to switch probably to the sequinome platform. And there are, there are um, groups, there are service facilities that you can send your samples to to, uh, to, have, um, to have them analyzed if, if, you're, if you're up there. So if you're working with, again, a reasonable number of samples, but for larger numbers of SNPs, not, not huge numbers, but larger numbers, sequinome would be probably the way you would want to you'd want to go next. And you can see it, it also these all these these platforms also have different uh, requirements for sample as well. Now, if you're getting into you know larger, much larger uh, SNPs uh, per sample, where you're trying to identify you know whole uh, whole sets of genes. Uh, and the SNPs in those genes, then you, you definitely would want to uh, move up to a higher throughput platform. And again, these are offered by service facilities. There are facilities that have these platforms up to 1,536 SNPs. Again, still the opportunity to, uh, to have some flexibility, um, not as high as sequinome or HRM, but you do have some flexibility to define the SNPs you're going to go after. And this is based, again, on going after targeted or known SNPs. The Illumina Golden Gate platform is, is really where you would want to go. And of course, cost goes up with these, but that makes, uh, but that makes sense. And the cost per SNP is actually um, fairly uh, um, reasonable if you go up to these levels of, of SNPs, if you use this, you know, these types of parameters on these platforms. And then finally, if you're just going for full genomic coverage, you want to just cover the genome and find out what SNPs are there and, and then use some powerful database software to determine the differences between your populations, you're definitely going to want to use some, something like aluminum and thinium or whatever. And again, there are service facilities that will provide whole genome SNPs. Uh, SNP analysis. So just to finish, um, if HRM is your choice in the lab, and uh, there are many labs that are doing HRM analysis uh, to, uh, to, to type uh, their, uh, their populations, um, this is a, is a great resource for you to use to design your experiment. So we wrote this article uh, in 2010 for researchers to follow very clear step-by-step -step guide to designing your experiment. So how to process your DNA, what you're looking for to validate your primers, uh, experimental design tips, all this kind of stuff is in this practical guide to high resolution melt genotyping. It's Tech 6004, uh, written by myself and, and, uh, and several colleagues within BioRad. 
You can access the article uh, here at this website, or you could simply just Google a practical guide to HRM, and you will be able to find it. Um, um, it will appear as one of the top hits on Google.